Welcome to the Engage Truth Podcast and YouTube channel where we test popular claims and objections against Christianity. And uh, today I'm uh, joined by two special guests, my lovely wife, Kendra Harrelson. Right. And right. also uh, we have Jay Warner Wallace, a cold case homicide detective with us and a popular uh, Christian apologist and author of many books and um, also an adjunct professor at Talbot School of Theology and a Southern Evangelical Seminary and a faculty member at Summit Ministries. So we're so excited to have you with us today, Jim. How are you doing today? Dude, you did that right. And you introduced Kendra before you introduced me. That was a smart <laughs> move, okay? So obviously you have a successful marriage and you've already learned <laughs> some of the important skills uh, as you move forward, even at a young age. So that's good. So yeah, yeah I, I glad I to be sleep here. on the couch. <laughs> that's right. Well, and you, all three of us know each other from uh, you know doing a cross examine instructors academy with Frank Turk. And so I was just looking forward to the opportunity to hang out with you today. We're good. Yeah. Well, I, again, I just want to thank you for coming on today. And uh, sure. I've been uh, following uh, your podcast and YouTube videos and uh, reading your books, Cold Case Christianity. I think I read it so many times it was about falling apart. And then I gave it away. And I have a couple of your other books, God's Crime Scene. Oh, that's great. Forensic Faith uh, Showcase on my book bookshelf there. Um, so right. I'm really excited. Good job. Yeah. yeah. So some about free advertisement. And right. um, so it, your website is also, um, correct me if I'm wrong, coldcasechristianity.com, right? That's right. That's right. Awesome. Yeah. And no, see, I think your approach is really attractive to many people because it, it's uh, unique as far as the field of apologetics, making the case for Christianity and responding to objections um, because you're coming at it from a detective angle. And I know for my wife, Kendra, that was appealing um, because, well, her, her mom also watches uh, detective shows as well. And sure. that was, you know, I think that was the first, uh, Cold Case Christianity was the first book, your apologetics book your mom read, right? Or it, I think so. I'm actually sure that that's the first one she ever touched. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, but I, it was also the first one I read because I grew up on all the shows that you make fun of in your um, presentations. And that's things. right. That's right. Yeah. All and the I, wrong I, I do make fun of you. For not being yeah. real. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I do make fun of those, right? Because if you don't make fun of them, you you find yourself um, falling into all the traps, right? That those silly shows will 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 do. So, exactly. yeah, I'm sorry, I make fun of those shows. I hate that, like the burst of bubbles, right? Of of whatever uh, people expect, right? From the from having watched these dramas, uh, but yeah, for the most part, they're not great. <laughs> you know, they're <laughs> not, exactly. they're just not great. It is. So. That's funny. Funny though, they're funny. Yes, they are. Yeah, but that's why I never like. I don't think probably anybody who's in a particular profession watches TV that has to do with their profession, right? Like, I'd be surprised if like emergency room doctors we used to watch ER or watch uh, uh, what's what's the big uh, hospital drama that's been on for like a twenty years. Um, Which you one? know what I'm talking about? Anatomy. Oh yeah, Grey's Anatomy, right? Grey's Anatomy, right? Like, but you think that, that maybe doctors are, well, I, I would be very surprised because they probably had every turn to do the same thing I do, which is like to say, really? We don't do it that <laughs> way, right? You know? But, but anyway. Yeah, well, you yeah. know, that's a good transition. You're thinking of sorting through what is uh, actual and what right. is fictional. Um, because today we're talking about a topic I know uh, that is important to Kendra and myself as well of um, are the are the gospels historically accurate and, and how do we know that they didn't just borrow from pagan mythologies? You know, cause I've been seeing this claim coming up a lot, especially in movies like Religious by Bill um, Mayer yeah. and Zeitgeist is, you can watch that on YouTube. Very popular and, YouTube. And so there's a lot of claims that, Oh, there's a lot of parallels. So maybe Christianity stole from that. And ultimately Christianity isn't even historically accurate, or maybe it's a very right. small semblance of it. So yeah. I'm excited to, to hear uh, your presentation today on that because my understanding is this is some new material also um, right. about a book that's coming out in the future, right? Yeah. So when I write a book, I think I talked about this. I'm not sure if when we did uh, CIA together, I was talking about this as much as I do now at CIA, uh, you know, like at these instructors academies. But um, and these are academies where we're learning how to teach each other how to be better apologists, right? Case makers in front of audiences. But I also say that I, we have to learn how to speak a language that I call visualish, which is uh, not really using words. It's using the words will come out of your mouth, but the stuff that's on the screen is language that is uh, designed visually. And sometimes you can have death by PowerPoint. So a lot of times when I'm writing a book like this, 
I spend a year just building the visual media. So I could do things like this with you to work out the bugs. And then once I've done that, I'm ready to write the book from the visual material. So it's not uh, word first, and then I try to find visual support. No, it's actually, how do I tell the story visually in front of a jury? And then I'll write a book about it. So what we're gonna do that today is we're gonna talk about this, these claims. And if you don't mind, I'm gonna hop into the presentation and I'll be back with you. So you can think about any questions you wanna ask and I'm gonna show you what this looks like. And once you see it, it's clearer, right? Like you'll be able to say, okay, I get it now. And this is what happens with jurors too, is they'll say, oh, I, 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 once you showed me this, whatever this piece of evidence was, it all clicked together for me. Okay, that's what we're trying to do here. So I'm gonna share a screen with you right now um, and just hop right into this presentation and, and you'll see uh, where we are headed. Okay, so let's just jump right in. For those of you who don't know my work, I, I, most of my work is done um, with uh, cold cases, cold case investigations. Uh, I, most of my cases, for example, uh, end up on, on Dateline and I've appeared there, I think, uh, more than any other de detective in the country. I'm part of a three generation uh, family of case makers. My son is doing the job now that I was doing for years before him. Uh, he's actually working as a detective now. He's reassigned last year. And uh, he basically is doing the same thing, the same work that I was doing before him because uh, he learned it from me, you know, for the most part. And uh, I did the same thing that, that I learned it from my dad. He has the same name. We have three generations of Jim Wallace's who have been working at our agency, uh, pretty much doing the same work. Um, so, I did some of this on, on, on a movie called God's Not Dead 2, where they asked me to make a case. And that's what we're going to do today, but we're going to do it a different way. Here's the thought experiment. Imagine, if you will, that we are in some future world on here on earth where an evil regime has come in in some dystopian future and decided they're going to eradicate all of Christianity. And they're going to do it by collecting every New Testament every Old Testament, every Bible, and burn every single Bible so that there is no manuscript evidence at all for Jesus of Nazareth from the New Testament. Could you still make a case for the existence, historicity, and deity of Christ if you had no New Testament? Like, like 10 years from now, somebody decides to burn them all. Yes, you could, and I'm going to show you how you do it. Now, I've had done a number of these cases where in the crime scene, I've got evidence from the body, from the weapon, from blood spatter, whatever it may be. And that's great when you have a case like that because you know that a felony has occurred and it's possible for you to find the felon because uh, I've had some of these where I knew, for example, uh, a husband was involved in this, but sometimes they're clever. And I can tell you, I've had cases where, they, where a guy has killed his wife and got rid of her body and then reported her missing. And I didn't even, nobody even investigated it for years. It was treated like a missing persons. So the, by the time they decided to investigate it as a murder, there was no crime scene, no evidence, no physical evidence. How do you make a case when you've got no evidence at all in the crime scene, even though you think you have a felon, a person of interest, who was involved in the crime? Well, I'll tell you how you do that. Uh, remember, that all crimes uh, are part of a timeline, and the timeline includes the stuff that occurs before the crime and the stuff that occurs after the crime. In other words, the time that occurs before the crime is kind of like a runway, right, that is ramping up to a point of detonation when someone's going to do something terrible, losing their temper and creating this, this bomb that's going to go off. Now, now this bomb that goes off, it doesn't just happen willy-nilly. There's a long runway. There's a fuse that is burning that, that actually is leading up to the, 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 the actual detonation. And, and, and then and it, when it explodes, when that fuse burns, and it burns all the way down to the, expl the explosion where someone does something they shouldn't do, there's a detonation that leaves all kinds of shrapnel and fallout all over the place. You know, for example, you, you might have a series of events where a man starts cheating on his wife and then starts plotting against to get rid of his wife and his relationship is seen to get more and more serious with the girlfriend. And then he starts to do the internet search to figure out how to dispose of bodies. Really? 
Like if you could track the fuse, you could see this crime's about to occur. And then afterwards, in terms of his being uh, you know, gone for a couple of days after that, and there's maybe a blood or tissue in the car, there's things that afterwards, there's fallout all over the place that demonstrates. And we make the case in situations like this from the fuse and the fallout. Does that make sense? The fuse and the fallout ultimately identify our person of interest. And, and as crazy as it sounds, this is really how we make a lot of our cases. We make them from the fuse and the fallout, the fuse and the fallout, if that makes sense. So the question becomes, um, you know, how, how does this apply to the story of Jesus? Well, Jesus also has a fuse that burns toward the appearance of Jesus of Nazareth. And after he appears, he changes everything. There's a fuse and a fallout related to Jesus. And what we're going to talk about today is just one part of the fuse that is burning toward the appearance of Jesus. I think the fuses actually can be described in three ways. There's a cultural fuse, a spiritual fuse, and a prophetic fuse. And today, all we're going to talk about is this spiritual fuse that is burning toward the appearance of Jesus. Now, let me open the time lap a little bit and to redraw it here for you. So here is a, I'm calling this 1 AD. Um, of course, this is where Jesus is born. All this is called BC back when I was a kid. Now it's called BCE. Uh, but this is really before, what, what is the event that either changes, it used to be called before Christ, BC, or before the common era. What's the common, what's the common era starts with the birth of Jesus. So either way you look at this, BC or BCE, you're stuck with Jesus as the hinge point in all of history. And this is what is going to burn. Now, now, what happens in this period, though, that tells us that something is going to happen over here and that something is going to be the birth of Jesus? Now, a lot of people would say, well, Jesus never even lived. Right? These are called Jesus mythers. And what they'll basically say is that there was a bunch of deities that look an awful lot like Jesus that preceded Jesus in the timeline. And that these deities were so much like Jesus that they demonstrate that Jesus wasn't really real. He was just another recreation of the same worn out, tired myth that preceded him. And so they would argue that, that, that they are not, that there is no Jesus. As a matter of fact, the last guy here before Jesus is a deity known as Mithras. And many people would argue that Mithras is very similar to Jesus. In fact, they're the same... I have seen people argue online, and I've actually had somebody come and talk to our youth group who was an atheist who, who described Mithras in this way, born of a virgin on December 25th in a cave attended by shepherds and considered to be a great teaching master who had 12 companions or disciples and promised his followers immortality and performed miracles and sacrificed himself and was buried in a tomb, rose from the grave after three days, was called the good shepherd, the way, the truth, the light. Really? You're telling me that that's actually Mithras? If that's, that's the description of Mithras, you can see why people might think that Jesus is just another line of mythology borrowed from prior mythology. Now, the problem, though, here is, and I've researched the, just, like, all this stuff uh, deeply just to see if any of these claims are true. It turns out that most of these claims about Mithras are not true. They're, they're all, they're just simply not historically true in what people believed about Mithras. Now, there's two there in the middle that are similar. Uh, he did promise his followers immortality, and he did uh, perform miracles. Well, gee, if, if you're thinking about a god of your imagination, it wouldn't be surprising to me to find that he would promise you immortality and he would perform miracles. That's not all that, uh, uh, this to me is not similar to Jesus at all. The fact uh, any god would do these two things. This, this to me seems to be the common um, uh, activity of gods in general, okay? You know, something interesting has happened. Um, I think all of us have this, this um, expectation uh, that God exists, even when we deny his existence. I'll give you an example of this. Here's a timeline here. Let's just bring the timeline into position. Uh, there was a writer in the New York Times who wrote an article um, talking about um, philosophers who believe that the entire um, universe is a computer simulation. What we're doing right now, they would argue, is a computer simulation. Here's how this works. They would say that, that imagine, for example, if you were have collected a bunch of computer programmers today, and they were asked to program and recreate 
uh, by way of simulation, computer simulation, the signing of the Declaration of Independence. That happened quite some time ago. And they're going to use the best computers they have to, uh, to, to recreate, to create a simulation, given what they know. And, but, it, you know, because the computers aren't, the, aren't that great. I mean, they're good, but they're not great enough to be able to you know, factor in every one of the characters' thoughts who existed at the time of the signing of the Declaration. That, that recreation would be relatively cartoonish, right? Because there's now, of course, if they had better computers, they could do a better job. And now suddenly this seems like it's a little more realistic. And if they had even better computers, they could do an even better job until their simulation, the declaration signing, might look really good. I mean, be, and, and these folks, you could even be programmed to have thoughts, conscious thoughts, perhaps, if your technology was good enough. Do you see that what they're saying here? What they're saying is that if I had enough technology, I could recreate a simulation of the past that would be real. Well, wait a minute. What if we are... In four, if there's a group future that we don't know about that has recreated with advanced technology our situation today, how would we know? Like the people in the past at the signing, how would they? We wouldn't even know that we are a computer simulation if the technology was good enough in the future to be able to 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 to, to plan and, and and factor in every independent thought of all the characters in the simulation. This thing could have a life of its own, right? And we wouldn't even know it. This is what Dr. Preston Green, in an article in the New York Times, said that you know we are living in this computer simulation, and and we might not even know it. And his article was called "Are We Living in a Computer Simulation?" Let's not find out. Let's not find out. No, because if we find out, now he argues here, by the way, that some of the things we see in our experience in the universe, like crime and injustice, these are defects. We see birth defects right now. We see disasters right now. Well, this, is, this demonstrates that we're in a computer simulation because this is where the computer simulation is not quite perfected yet. Because the technology is not good enough, we find that there's crime, injustice, defects, and disasters because the simulation is not good enough, <laughs> okay? This is his view. Now, he, he says we should not really um, find out because if we find out that we're in a simulation, they would know that we found out. And, and then they might get mad. One of these folks might get so mad um, that he, he might do something to us to, to change the simulation, to punish us for finding out. We should not tamper with this because we don't want these people who are designing our future to get mad at us. Does that make, that's, that's his view. Isn't that interesting? Wow. Do you see what he's doing here, what these philosophers are doing? They're saying, in essence, that there is a creative power that transcends our universe, that has created our world from nothing, and that it's our human failing that will result in imperfection. We don't want to, if we, we were to find, get mad and find out that this is a, we would basically incur the wrath of this creative power, and that our creators will ultimately judge us. We should respect and fear what they've done and not, not make them mad. Do, do you see what they've just done here? They've recreated the Christian worldview. <laughs> They just replace the characters. And this is surprise me, really, because the, the, the truth of it is, is that most of us are, think deeply about God. Only 7% of the world's population is actually atheist or agnostic. In fact, humans have an innate belief in God and the afterlife. And we've seen this now in a number of studies in Boston University that determined that religion cannot be understood as resulting primarily from education or from passive acquisition from parents or society. That's not where it comes from. At Yale, they did a study that said that creationism and belief in God is bred in the bone. The universal themes of religion are not learned. They emerge as accidental byproducts of our mental systems. They are part of human nature. Isn't that interesting? That's from Yale. Oxford a University study put it this way, the concept of God as creator is hardwired in the human consciousness. Atheism is definitely an acquired position. That's interesting. Also from that study, young people have a predisposition to believe in a supreme being because they assume that everything in the world was created with a purpose. Children's minds are not a level playing field. They are tilted in the direction of belief. Wow, why would that be true? Let's go back to our timeline for a second. So we have this fuse that is burning 
toward the appearance of Jesus. It's a spiritual abuse. And it's burning because these are the, the actual deities in the order in which they appear in history. These are the mythologies in the order in which they appear in history. And so as I examined these and read through all of them, I found the majors and I focused on the majors and I realized that there are 15 common characteristics. Now I'm going to show you these characteristics by... Um, using the letter I, okay, you know, it's just, I'm sorry, Baptist pastors, we always have to alliterate everything with letters, right? So here we go. These are the 15 things that these deities share in common, all right? So the first is this, that, that all of them, um, or not, not all of them, many of them, uh, they're, they're for, they're, their coming was foretold, a prophecy. Um, I call this the notable aspect of these. And I think that makes sense because as humans, we have this expectation, as we just talked about, that there is a God. We anticipate God's coming. So it's not unusual. It doesn't seem like it would be unusual to me that we would be preceded by people who expect to come. Thoraster, for example, was foretold from the beginning of time. That's what it said in the mythology, okay? Here's another uh, number two in the similarities. Uh, I call this imperial. Um, th these deities have a royal heritage. Well, that doesn't surprise me because uh, I think we think of God in a royal way. And the only earthly comparison we have, especially in primitive cultures, is to think of kings and, ro and royalty. So humans recognize that superiority of God. I would expect this attribute to emerge. Adonis, for example, was conceived by Mira and King uh, Deus. Also, they have a third characteristic, so I call inexplicable. Um, they're born by some unnatural means. They appear uniquely and miraculously. Well, no kidding. I mean, if, if God is going to be supernatural by nature, then I would expect him to show up in a supernatural way. His, the way he appears is going to be unique. So, for example, Krishna was conceived without sexual intercourse and just appears. This is not unusual. They all, Mithras, for example, appeared out of the side of a mountain, leaving a hole in his, in his, in his, uh, behind him. So, so that's a supernatural appearance, right? Here's another similarity I call insulated. Many of these were protected as a child in some way. By the way, Jesus has all, all these attributes, right? Jesus was protected as a child. I think humans assume that God will, will, will understand them and will at some point reach out to them as one of them. That's not an uncommon expectation. Buddha, for example, his parents prevented him from seeing the ugliness of the world, it's said. Many of these deities face a temptation because they are seen to be at some point, if they're going to interact with us, they're going to take on some human characteristics so we can interact with them. And if that's the case, they would expect them by empathizing with us to face some of the same things we face. So Heracles, for example, was tempted by vice and by virtue. Uh, some of these are actually associated with shepherds. And that's not um, um, unusual, given that that was a standard uh, concept that related to caretaking. Shepherds were always seen as a model of, 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 of people who cared for their flock. And if God is going to care for us, it wouldn't surprise me that he would be analogized with shepherds, by, by, especially by cultures in which shepherds were prominent. So I think humans anticipate this omnibenevolence of God, and they find an example to, to analogize toward. So, for example, Osiris was the shepherd and caretaker of his people. Uh, many of these, of course, have supernatural power. Well, no kidding. We expect God to be omnipotent. So uh, even like something that comes much later in history, like uh, Quetzalcoatl from um, uh, South America, had the power to create the world in the first humans. That's not unusual to see that there's a God out there that creates everything. That's pretty common, right? You would expect that. Here's another uh, interesting similarity, interacting. Um, most, some, most, if not all, of these gods will somehow interact with their, not all of them, but some, most of them will interact with, their, with his, her, uh, his creation. So humans, I think, that I can understand why humans might expect this, right? Because if there is a god that has created us, would he ever interact with us? Tammuz, for example, engages a farmer while courting his future wife. Um, many of these are instructive in some way. They will teach their followers. They will teach us. Well, I think we imagine that God is going to be omniscient, have 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 a supernatural uh, insight and knowledge, all, all knowledge. Uh, I call this indemnifier. This is a, a need that, that is recognized for a sacrifice. You see this pretty commonly with many of these gods. And it really is about, I think, humans understanding that when they do something wrong, they need to pay a price for it. Uh, and that's a pretty common moral con concept. And if there's a God that is the standard of all moral judgment, then I would expect that at times we're going to do things he would judge us for. So Shangi, for example, desired animal sacrifice, especially uh, the bull and the lamb. 
Um, another one is indicted. Uh, some of these gods actually face a judicial trial. Remember, Jesus faced a trial. Um, and, and I think that's because we expect that if God is the standard of, uh, even he would have to live up to it, to whatever the moral standards are. And there might be some, uh, for example, Dionysius appeared before uh, King Pentheus on charges of claiming divinity. That sounds pretty similar to Jesus. Um, here, uh, an inviter. God, most of these gods, or some of these gods at least, will share or establish a divine meal in which um, they interact with humans. And I think if you thought that God is going to interact with you, it wouldn't surprise me that you would think that one of the ways he might interact with you is through a meal. Mithras, for example, shared a meal with Sol. His followers celebrated with a meal. That may have been stolen from Christian believers, uh, actually, but even however, no matter how you look at it, this is not uncommon amongst these gods. Uh, getting close to the end here, an intercessor. Uh, a lot of these gods offer eternal life. Well, yeah, I think that humans expect that God's going to live eternally and might offer that to us. That doesn't surprise me. Zalmoxis uh, promised immortality to the souls of brave warriors, for example. And a lot of these gods are described as being immortal. They have power over death. Well, yeah, I, I think we'd expect God to be eternal and supernatural and have power over death. Indra, for example, was cut into pieces but overcame death and uh, was reassembled. <laughs> So this is many different stories about how that might happen. In Dider, uh, God is seen as the God who will judge the living and the dead. I think that makes sense to us because we think that God will be the ultimate source of justice. Uh, Tucker Julie, for example, was the judge of humans, uh, both before and after their death. Now, now look, I've just given you, and I've looked for more, but this is as similar as you're going to get. The similarity is the list of similarities between uh, Persian, Roman, Greek, other gods that preceded Jesus. Here's the total list. There it is. That's all of it right there. That is every way that these gods are similar. Now, of course, there's many things, ways in which they're not similar, but let's go back to our timeline for a second. So here's our timeline prior to the existence of Jesus. We have this kind of burning uh, fuse, and I'm going to list all of the attributes of each god on the top of the timeline, and I'll put the gods on the bottom as this fuse burns. You can kind of see it here. It's burning toward the appearance of, you know, toward the, the turning of BC to AD or BCE to CE. So now you see all of the attributes. There they are. These are all of the attributes of the gods. Now you'll see that not every god has all the attributes. It's kind of hit or miss, right? But these are the commonalities. These are the most common attributes. And even these, you can see, really aren't that common. But, but, but they at least have some of these, right? And you'll see that some of these attributes appear in every deity. For example, we've already talked about it, right? Well, no kidding. Every one of these has the incredible attribute that they have supernatural power to appear here miraculously. Well, no, duh. That, that's pretty much what you would expect from God. Uh, not, you know, if, not all of them, but most of them also have this thing we call um, inexplicable. inexplicable. Um, this idea that, that uh, he, you know, um, not only does he have power, he could appear miraculously. Um, not all of them, but most of them, for example, have the power to defeat death. So you can kind of see that's, you know, a couple of them are missing that. Uh, not all of them, but most of them have the power to provide uh, eternal life. So there are some missing places here. But for the most part, these are the most common attributes. Well, what's interesting about this is that only one deity has all of the 15 commonalities. These all share these commonalities to one degree or another, but there's one deity, and of course that deity is at the end of the fuse. It's just Jesus that has all of these things. Jesus alone has all of them, and they all kind of coalesce, coalesce rather, in the person of Jesus. I think that's interesting that all of these attributes exist in, in part, but in all the other deities, but they exist in total in Jesus. It's only Jesus that has the supernatural power to arrive unexpectedly, perform the miracles, defeat death, and, and provide eternal life. This is why I think C.S. Lewis puts it this way. The story of Christ is simply a true myth, a myth working on us in the same way as the others, but with the tremendous difference that it really happened. And one must be content to accept it in the same way, remembering that it's God's myth, where the others are men's myths. The pagan stories are God expressing himself through the minds of pagans, the poets, using such images as he found there, while Christianity is God expressing himself through what we call 
real things. And that makes sense to me. And it makes sense to Paul also, especially when Paul appeared uh, on the road, I mean, uh, in, in Athens, in Acts 17, he provided a message at the Areopagus in Athens. And here is basically what Paul said from Scripture, and I'll try to decode it in Jim Wallace terms, okay? He said, men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects, for while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Kind of what Paul's thinking here is like, you know, you people are really, uh, you know, we worship all kinds of gods because you're in Athens under Roman control and Romans would allow you to worship any God you want as long as you worship their gods too. Then he says, therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands. It's almost like what Paul is saying, hey, you've imagined some things correctly, but a lot of what you're thinking about right now is not true. He made from one man every nation of mankind to live all on all the face of the earth, that they would have seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. Kind of like Paul saying, oh, it's pretty awesome that you've been seeking and groping for God through all these ages. You've imagined certain things, but I'm here to shit, tell you the truth. Even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. So, you know, your thoughts and your imagination can only take you so far because you're a human after all. God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed. The fuse of your imagination has now burned to its end. God is going to reveal himself to you. And having furnished proof to all men by rising him from the dead, unlike your imaginary gods, we saw the true living God with our own eyes. Paul also said that death reigned from Adam until Moses, even those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come, a type, a type of him who was to come. Hey, you think that the pagan gods were similar to Jesus? Really? If I described this, had this description right here, uh, somebody who escaped death at a king's decree as a baby and lived in Egypt and was tempted while in the wilderness and taught God's law from a mountain and worked miracles in the, with the sea and, and fed thousands miraculously with bread and served as a mediator for his people and spoke the word of God to his followers and was known for gentleness and strength, you'd swear I'm talking about Jesus. But I'm not. I'm talking about Moses. Moses, who was a very strong type of Jesus. I said there's a guy whose name means God saves, and he began in obscurity but rose to a position of honor and was anointed to lead and shepherd his followers and brought deliverance to the enemies of God and appointed 12 uh, uh, means and, uh, as important leaders. And then did for God's children what Moses could not do and promised and gave rest to his people, even interceded for the sins of his people. You swear I'm talking about Jesus. I'm talking about Joshua. Huh. How about this one? Uh, was the object of his father's love, was underestimated and dismissed by his family, was able to resist a temptation, uh, fed bread to people when they were hungry, was stripped of his robe and delivered to the Gentiles, was sold by someone who trusted, he trusted for just pieces of silver, stood before the rulers in the assembly and was falsely accused. It's not Jesus either. That's Joseph. How about this? Born in the town of Bethlehem, identified as a shepherd king, amazed at the elders when he was young, came to the scene from an unexpected pedigree. His popularity with the masses angered the leaders. He was anointed by God, though, to lead and shepherd his people. He spent time in the wilderness, had no place to lie his head, and was betrayed by those he served, but trusted God anyway. That's not Jesus either. That's David. Slept on a boat during a storm, calmed the storm to an amazement of all the people on, on the boat, spent three days given up for dead, and then after three days spent 40 days teaching, preached repentance to the Gentiles, knew that salvation belonged to the Lord, and was willing to die because of God's grace toward humans, interceded for the sins of his people. That's not even Jesus. That's Jonah. It turns out that Jesus is being described really well uh, by all the types. He's, he's far more similar to the types in Judaism than he is to the types outside of Judaism. Look at this list of all of these descriptions. You will see that none of these actually, you know, like, like with, the, with the pagan gods, uh, there's a lot of repetition. Over and over and over again, the same attributes are described, and we see a pattern of similarities. But here, 
actually, there's not much similarity. There's not much repetition. This in its totality is a very strong description of Jesus, but there's not a lot of repetition from each of these characters, from each of these descriptions. It takes all of them to actually describe Jesus. And isn't that interesting? There's a fuse burning, even within Judaism, as each of these characters comes providing a stronger and stronger cumulative type that is only found in its entirety at the very end. Same as with the pagan gods, you don't see the similarities, you don't see all of those similarities grouped until Jesus appears. Now that's very interesting to me. You have the book of nature, you have, you have these pagan myths added to the Jewish um, uh, characters of the Old Testament. Why is that? Why is it these two things? It's like you have the now revelation, the book of nature that pagans see, and they describe God from the book of nature. And then you have the book of scripture the Jews have that describe God more completely. Isn't that interesting? In the book of nature, you see the same things repeatedly said over and over again. But in the special revelation of scripture, you see the specific descriptions of Jesus offered one historic person at a time. Why would God do it this way? Well, I think it's because thoughtful, attentive humans have reasonable expectations, and God wants to meet our God-given reasonable expectations. But expectations require two things. First, they require an expector, and then they require the expected. So let me give it to you in a similar, uh, kind of in a similar, I, I worked undercover for a number of years, and we used to work um, burglaries, residential burglaries, and we'd be parked in neighborhoods uh, and the worst way to work a burglary a series is to not know who the bad guy is and just have to sit in neighborhoods hoping that the bad guy will come into your neighborhood. And I was doing that one of these days. It was a terrible way. To, these are called geographic surveillances. They're not usually useful. They don't have enough information to know who's doing it. You just know kind of where they're doing it. So you're sitting in neighborhoods. And, and sure enough, I'm sitting in the neighborhood all day and I hear on the radio, the police critic, I've got my scanner on. I hear the police, uh, somebody calls and it wants to report a burglary about two blocks from where I was sitting. And I was like, really? How did I miss that? I'm just two blocks away from it. This guy came home. He saw his house was burglarized. He's only gone to the market for a couple of hours. It happened in the last two hours and I missed it. So I hearing this guy, I was in a plane car. I was working undercover for like maybe three years into this assignment. I drove over there as fast as I could. And I parked my car and I got out and I wanted to ask this guy, you know, hey, tell me more about this bad guy. Tell me more about what you, what you saw. Did, how did he break in? Did he kick the door? Did he go through a window? I just want to know. Maybe we can still catch this guy. Did you see anybody leave? Did you see any weird cars parked on the street? I get out of my car, and this is what I looked like in those days. Okay? And, and I know, he, he looked at me like, who the heck are you? He would not cooperate with me. He wouldn't even answer my questions. Seconds later, the patrol officer shows up, gets out of his car, and now this guy is completely cooperative with the, with the patrol officer. Really? Like, why wouldn't you talk, tell this to me? Well, because he had an expectation that a police officer was going to show up. And when I showed up, I didn't meet his expectation. He was like, oh, you don't look like that, dude. So he didn't talk to me. It turns out the more the expected meets the expectations of the expector, the better the response is. And that's why I think when it comes to Jesus of Nazareth, that there was a need or a desire to meet the expectations of those who were expecting. And Jesus does all of that and more. So let's go back to our spiritual fuse for a second. Um, and I want to show you something kind of cool. So if God wanted to show up on planet Earth to meet the expectation of people who believed in these prior mythologies, he'd have to show up when these mythologies are still active. So here, for example, is uh, Osiris. You'd have to show up because Osiris was worshipped from 3300 3, to about 250 AD, and then you don't have anyone worshipping Osiris. So you'd have to show up in that range. And you'd have to show up uh, if you wanted to meet the expectations of people who believe in the... So I'm looking at all these different deities, right? These are the major deities. And I'm just showing you in this graph here when they were worshipped, okay? So you can kind of see... Zoroaster, for example, there are still people who worship Zoroaster, believe it or not. Uh, Krishna, there are still people who worship Krishna. So he's going to go over here to the far side. Of course, there are still Buddhists. So you have to be in here. But you'll see that if, even with just this, these few deities I've listed so far, if you wanted to show up when all of them are still being worshipped, you'd have to show up in this red zone right here. 
because that's where all of them are still in, uh, being worshipped. Make sense? Now, there's another fuse, a prophetic fuse. I didn't talk about this today, uh, but this is another fuse that burns before we begin. And in this fuse, it's about Jewish prophecy. And we know in the prophecy of Daniel that the, the Messiah is supposed to show up between uh, the proclamation to rebuild the temple and the fact that the point at which the temple is finally destroyed. That is between 444 uh, BC and 70 AD when the temple is destroyed. So now we have another overlap. And, and that means that you have to be in this overlap now if you wanted to show up considering that fuse to meet that expectation. Culture, though, is another part of the fuse. And it turns out you, certain things have to be in place before the message of God through Jesus can be transmitted. For example, you'd have to have common language within the empire. And that means you'd have to have an empire that's big enough to actually create the common language and create the roads, build the roads. You know, the Greeks, for example, were mostly a shipping uh, culture, uh, used the sea to travel, but not a lot of roads were built. Roads were built under the Roman Empire. Language was unified under the Roman Empire. And in fact, it was Roman rule that created the stability and the tolerance, actually, for uh, many uh, world religions to coexist within the empire. And in fact, there is a 200-year peace, which is called the Pax Romana, that, that exists right here in this range. Now, interestingly, if you wanted to show up to take advantage of both the spiritual fuse and the prophetic fuse and this cultural fuse, You'd have to show up in this red zone right here. And interestingly, someone does show up in that red zone right there and divides all of history between BCE and CE. And that person, of course, is Jesus of Nazareth. He is the person of interest that we can predict by the fuse alone, that he would show up. Somebody's going to show up. If you look at every other character that shows up in that little red zone, none of them had a global impact the way that Jesus did. None of them met the expectations of the spiritual fuse the way that Jesus did. So it turns out Jesus of Nazareth is actually makes better sense of the fuse. And we haven't talked about any of, of, the, of the fallout, but I just wanted to talk about the fuse today because it deals with this. And remember, that makes sense because Scripture tells us that since the beginning of the creation of the world, that his, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen. You know, they're understood by what's been made so that no one's got an excuse. As a matter of fact, uh, it says in Ecclesiastes that God has made everything appropriate in its time. He's also set eternity in our hearts. That's why we expect this to happen. We expect God to be here and when he's going to show up, yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning, even to the end. Paul says in 2 Timothy, God has saved us and called us with a holy calling not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So why would we be surprised that um, this is all predicted and we expected it, and then it met our expectations when it uh, actually happened? So I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to stop that share. So I can rejoin you guys. Now that that basically is my response. I, I actually think that the more you examine um, the other mythologies that, that precede Jesus, they are not a strike against Jesus and, or a way of, of diminishing the, the truth about Jesus. In fact, they, they actually support the case for Jesus because they lay the foundation that none of them actually materialize until the appearance of Jesus. And then he's basically the exclamation point on every religious expectation that preceded him. And this is true not only for the pagan mythologies, it's also true for the types that we see in Jewish Old Testament uh, scriptures. So I think that he satisfies both of those in a way that to me is just amazing because all of the expectations of prior mythologies coalesce in Jesus. And then all of the pieces of the pizza that are described about Jesus about the coming Messiah that are, are typed in Jonah and Joshua and Moses, all of those parts come together to complete the, to complete the, the pizza. You know, each one's a slice and Jesus is the whole. So I think that that is, is why I think that the evidence is really good. And by the way, even if I had no from the New Testament, I would have reason to believe something big is going to happen about when it did. Yeah, so then, of course, there's also a fallout that occurs afterwards where you have to ask yourself the question, you know, which of these, and there's a bunch of people who appear in the first century in that place that's in the red square. Um, and they are, you know, they're, they're, some of them are emperors. 
Some of them are world leaders, philosophers, historians, and other religious leaders. None of them combined had the impact that Jesus did on history. So I think that, you know, when you're looking for, for who's going to show up in the red box, well, it turns out only one person shows up in the red box that will actually uh, fill the bill. Oh, that's so awesome. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I'm so, I'm so excited to, to read your uh, upcoming book. I know. Um, and I know, you, I know you, there's more you're going to cover in there. Brad, I'm, I'm flattered you, you should say that. It's been more work than I ever thought it would be, <laughs> uh, only because I'm trying to see it. For example, I didn't realize there was a red box mm. until I started to graph the dates of all the prophecies, of all the, the mythologies, and I'm not knowing enough about you know uh, world history in terms of when do all these things fall in place. You know, it's not just a few things I showed you on the cultural thing. It's all kinds of things. You don't have written languages until a certain time, and you can track the history of written languages. And then it turns out it's in it's in Italy when a, a certain version of spoken language becomes adopted, and then becomes of course because the Roman Empire controlled so much of the world, the known world. Even, even the road from Asia, the Silk Road that gets you from China to the Roman Empire is not in place until just before Jesus shows up. And this is this, the same, these are the same roads that, that, that Paul used. He used the Roman roads uh, to travel in the book of Acts. You, you couldn't do what Paul did in the book of Acts until a certain time in history. And then when that time is set, something like the appearance of God on planet Earth will take off. Right. That's awesome. You know, uh, I've heard uh, one person say that as far as the comparisons between the gospel accounts and the pagan mythologies, they say one unique thing is that none of them claim to be eyewitnesses of a historical event, but right. the disciples were eyewitnesses of the event. Is that correct to say? Yeah, no, that, that, is, that is correct. So in other words, you don't have, you don't have claims um, in the actual texts that people use to reconstruct the mythologies that make these like, like John would say, you know, I'm the person who wrote this and I saw this and there's a bunch more stuff that Jesus did that if somebody had documented that you wouldn't be able to put it in all the libraries of the world. Those kinds of things you don't see being said, but even more interesting is if you look at the nature of um, this is some of the stuff I had to examine for the fallout. It turns out the nature of these gods is pretty lame. The, the moral nature of all the mythological gods. They are willing to kill you for your wife, uh, to cheat, uh, to steal your wife, to be uh, doing, getting drunk and doing something stupid because they're drunk that then changes the course of human history. I mean, if you really were to read all of the battles back and forth between the gods, the, the, the kind of debauchery that is so common, is, if you just went back and looked at the paintings that people painted in a, who actually liked the idea of the pan gods, the pantheon of gods are almost always depicted drinking half naked and drunk half naked and carousing half naked. So it's the nature of the gods that I think you'll find is strikingly dissimilar to the, the moral teaching of Jesus and the nature of Jesus. Um, I think, and that's one of the things that's so revolutionary about his character, especially compared to someone like a Mithras or compared to someone like any of those gods I mentioned in this discussion, uh, most of them, if you look at their mythologies, um, they're pretty bizarre mythologies. They're not, they're not th this kind of, now, of course, there's a rich tradition, too, of, of people like Buddha, who come and have a higher moral ethic, right? Uh, of people, so that, of Baha'u'llah, who follows years later, who had a high moral ethic. Um, so, and, or at least people who would want themselves to be seen as having a high moral ethic. Mm -hmm. One of the things I'm also looking at is how Jesus then impacts all, all of the um, world religions that either preceded him, like Buddhism. It turns out that, that uh, almost every world religion can make a place or will borrow something from Jesus. So there's a place in the pantheon of, of, of manifestations, for example, of God in the Baha'i faith for Jesus. But there is no place in the, the, the Christian worldview for Baha'u'llah. So, so you have to... It's interesting to me to see how it's not just that, that he shows up, it's that then people begin to accommodate him or emulate him, like the Mormons, um, you know, so borrow from him all the non canonicals, all the Gnostic non canonicals are people who actually like Jesus and they like what they can borrow from Jesus, yet they want to take what is true about Jesus and twist it for their own purpose. 
which is what you would expect. There's a legend that evolves around certain historic characters uh, because they were bigger than life. And, and, and they end up, that, that part of those, those concentric um, ripples, people always say, well, how come only four people wrote about Jesus then? Well, we, those are the eyewitness counts. Now, if you wanted to look at the people who wrote all kinds of crazy things about Jesus, there's a lot of those, which is what I would expect if somebody was actually showed up and did what Jesus did. I want to leverage that for my view. I want to leverage that for my group. I want to tap into the power and mystique of Jesus. And by the way, that's happening with Jesus more than it's, who else is that happening with? That's so fascinating to me that people are willing to leverage Jesus for all kinds of things that you don't see that happening in other world religions. Right. You know, I, I have a, a friend I've been dialoguing with Salman. Um, he holds to a, a naturalist worldview and he would say, yeah that really to claim that the gospels are history is is more of a claim of the god of the gaps of wishful thinking that you want something to be true um therefore you're you're claiming that there must be a god or you're arguing from ignorance to try to explain uh, seemingly supernatural phenomenon and and i know of course in your presentation you cover that some but what would your short answer be to that in light of what we've just covered yeah, I think all of us hold to a worldview, regardless of what it is, that has less than complete information. So if I hold a naturalistic, atheistic worldview, I held that for 35 years, even though I couldn't explain how the universe came into existence from nothing, how all space, time, and matter came from nothing, not space, time, or matter preceding it, but from truly nothing, how that why are the universe looks fine-tuned. Well, how, you know, how a life originates from non-life, why it appears to be designed afterwards, uh, why we have, how do we get immaterial minds and consciousness from the materialistic process? How is it that then we also have free agency if we're in a deterministic kind of physicalistic universe? How, how can there be objective moral truths if there is not an objective moral standard that transcends all of us and is personal so that our objective moral obligations make sense? Remember, you're not, you're not morally obligated to physics, but you are morally obligated to persons. And finally, how there can be a standard that would unify all of our perceptions of evil so that, that evil is more than just an opinion, but is actually um, a violation of an objective uh, transcendent standard of righteousness, right? Look, I couldn't answer any of those questions. I, I, and, and people will try, but they're not satisfying. And they know they're not satisfying. That's why so many atheists have different ways of trying to fill in that gap. Yet they hold to the view, even though the evidence chain is short of the goal. And by the way, this is true for every worldview. I'm not going to say it's not true for us, but it is true. For, no, it's true for us too. All of us have a gap at the end of the evidence trail. We simply have to figure out uh, how big is the gap and are we willing to cross over it? Are we willing to, is, is it a reasonable inference to step? I think these, these trails lead in different directions right. and, and, and they're all different lengths. And I think the Christian worldview, though, does uh, lead to something powerful, and it has the shortest gap in terms of, because, you know, look, if you're designed in the image of God, who is a personal creative force, not an impersonal force at the beginning of the universe, that explains the beginning of the universe, because God is sitting outside of time, space, and matter. It also is, it, uh, it explains why I see information, which always comes from mind in DNA, why I see the evidence of a designer, because there's the existence of a designer, and even why there's a moral standard, a reflection of God's nature, which transcends all of us. I mean, I do think he, that God, as traditionally uh, conceived, actually uh, answers the questions that all of us have. So I would, first of all, admit that, yes, we all, are, have, we all believe something is true, even though we have less than a complete evidence set. But I think our evidence set's pretty strong. And I think it's much stronger than, and, than the uh, atheist evidence set. Right. No, I absolutely agree. And I, I like how you break down in, in several other talks you've done the difference between a possible inference and a reasonable inference, because I think that's the thing you're saying is the gap is the shortest in the Christian worldview, ultimately. Yeah. And I've heard people call, talk about the difference between possible and plausible because they really kind of want to alliterate, you know, that P, P, possible, plausible. Yeah. <laughs> but I always try to keep it and in, in, in couch it in um, detective and in court terms, right? We don't use possible doubt and plausible doubt. We mm -hmm. use possible doubt as a standard, which is too high. And then we use reasonable doubt 
as the standard we're shooting for because there are going to, like, as, as judges say to jurors all the time, the jury instructions in California read it this way, that yes, I can level a possible, judges tell this to juries, I can level a possible or imaginary doubt against anything you might believe. So we can't have that as our standard because you'll always have a possible doubt. You'll always have our imaginary doubt. But reasonable doubts are different. Reasonable doubts are the doubts that are really supported by evidence that you find to be more reasonable as an inference than the evidence that the prosecutor has given you. So if that's the case, then no problem. You've got a reasonable doubt. And then you should, you should acquit. You should uh, vote um, as not guilty. So and remember, there's a difference between not guilty and innocent. We don't find people innocent. And they find people not guilty. They may still be, uh, uh, be to blame for something, but we would say the standard has not been met. So we would render them not guilty uh, as opposed to innocent. There's not a, we don't render people innocent. So yeah, anyway. that, that's really helpful because I was, I was listening to an atheist earlier saying that Christians are ignoring yeah. any, any possible seeming uh, problems yeah. with our conclusion that, Jesus rose from the dead and the gospels are reliable. And I don't think that's the issue there. There are things that may seem like an objection, but I don't think it's the most reasonable. Objection. Sure. I think honestly, there's a litmus test for this. If you were to take out every supernatural element of the four gospels, so all you had left were the travels, relationships, and teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. That's all you had. Take out everything supernatural, including predictions of the future. Take that stuff out. Nobody is going to bat an eye at the historicity, the existence, and the unbelievably deep historical data we have for manuscript evidence for the person of Jesus. I mean, he is far better attested than Tiberius Caesar, who ruled at the time that Jesus was uh, doing his ministry. We have far more data for Jesus than we have for that emperor, okay? Nobody is going to doubt the existence of Jesus, uh, but we have a bias typically, especially in this generation, that we don't like things that are supernatural. We don't trust the supernatural aspect. It is the bias against the supernatural that causes people to doubt the Gospels. Because I can tell you, if you took out that stuff, there'd be no argument. People would just give in to this. Yeah, Jesus lived. Yeah, no problem. But he makes certain claims on our lives. He holds a certain uh, uh, high standard morally and, and then he, these crazy things that people don't believe in anymore, which are any su supernatural act, any supernatural intervention. But look, if there's a God, if there's a personal creative force, let's put it that way, that has personally created the universe from nothing. If that's just not a physical uh, you know, accident or just a matter of, of, of physics that was bound to happen, if instead that is the act of a creative personal being, well, then why would we doubt anything on the New Testament pages? Because by comparison, those are really small kind of miracles compared to everything from nothing. So I, I, look, even I can, can stop the movement of this, of this uh, mouse. I can catch it before it hits the desk. I can, as a human, limited human, can intervene and stop the forces of nature, if that's all there are. Why wouldn't I think that the, the actual um, cause of natural forces could not intervene in a similar way? Uh, or even a more dramatic way. So I think that um, that to me doesn't seem like it's all that unreasonable. Yeah, absolutely. It seems like naturalism prevents you from going to the most reasonable conclusion of Jesus physically rose from the dead. Um, yeah, and again, it's kind of like scientism, right? This idea that we're not against science. Science is one of the uh, fallout uh, uh, things I'm studying in terms of how Jesus set the table for the kind of science we do today. Uh, but I would say that, that, that uh, the idea that the only way we can know anything is through a scientific experiment, this idea of scientism as the only way to know the truth, that's something we would reject. But I don't think that's even, that even if I was an atheist, I would probably reject that because I would have said, hey, yeah, you can't, you know, science requires math facts before you can do science. You don't discover math facts with science. You use math to discover scientific data so i you know so, certain things you don't you can't use science to to determine um laws of logic you know uh, beauty moral truths there's a bunch of stuff you cannot discover with science but those have to be presented philosophically before you can do science and so i don't know and that to me is, is we have the ability to philosophize to think about things because we have been designed by a singular rational deity and that to me is, is huge because it changed science think about that 
the deities that existed before Jesus, before Yahweh, let's say the Jewish version of, of uh, idea and concept of Yahweh, uh, were not singular, rational, moral. I mean, they were capricious. There were times when you could say, well, why is the world the way it is? Well, because the gods are, you know, they're all over the place. They're, you know, you just, why even look into it? Why even examine it? It's, why even try to discover what causes lightning? You know, uh, Zeus causes lightning. Why did it happen today? I guess Zeus is angry. I mean, look, if, 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 if God is not separate from his creation and is not a singular, unified, uh, moral, rational being, it's kind of going to be kind of hard to do science. We assume that first. And once you do that, it changes the way you look at the world around you. And that's exactly what happened after Jesus showed up, uh, after the Jewish uh, uh, nation uh, rose, is you have it the ability. And by the way, if you look at... Nobel laureates, in, in terms of, of, of uh, historically, the people who have won Nobel prizes in the sciences, you will find that uh, most of them are, are Christian or Jewish. Uh, they are. And that's because we had a head start in terms of how we, we were able to do science with, with the notion that we were simply um, thinking the thoughts of God after him. Hang on a sec. Okay. We were able to do science with the notion that we were simply thinking the thoughts after God. God's thoughts after him. And you'll see people like Kepler and Copernicus and people who are the fathers of some major disciplines in science. They are historically Christians. Um, and that's something I think is powerful, right? Uh, you could say, oh, look, um, Muslims, they dominated the science in the Dark Ages. And they did have a big, huge role in the sciences, and then they stopped. Uh, they, they were, by the time of the scientific revolution, you won't see a lot of Muslims doing science. We have to decide today as Christians if we are going to be similar. And we don't need to be. So if you're a young person who's watching this and you're a Christian and you're interested in the sciences, please become a scientist because you don't have to abandon your Christian worldview. In fact, it was your Christian worldview that gave birth to the sciences and uh, many of the earliest uh, disciplines were, were, were initiated and led by Christian thinkers. Yeah, I amen and second that. That's yeah. awesome. I'll do uh, one last question and then we'll wrap sure. up our time. Um, I know yeah. one that's brought up is, um, often is the differences in the Gospels. Doesn't that make it seem like Christianity is, is just like the pagan religions, is not really historical, just explanations trying to, to fit that type? Um, how, do, how, from a detective perspective, how do you deal with those differences in the resurrection accounts in particular? Um, does well, that well, discredit? Well, here's, what, here's what's great about Christianity compared to other mythologies. Uh, myth I, say, I don't want to say other in the sense that I mean that G uh, Christianity is also a mythology, but in terms of other uh, theistic worldviews that preceded Christianity, um, th they typically will have a story that then will change over time, uh, but they don't have four, four accounts that are written simultaneously, or at least coexist. We know that because uh, the disciples of the disciples are quoting all the different Gospels. So it's clear that they have access to all of these stories. It's not that Mark evolved into Matthew, that then evolved into Luke, that then evolved into John. No, these were in existence simultaneously, and people even tried like a uh, adaptation to 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 meld all four, to harmonize all four gospels into one large document. Right? That's interesting, right? Because it's not like we have one story passed on to somebody. Um, this is what we have in every pagan mythology. Christianity offers four accounts that are current, concurrent, and of, of one deity, one God, Nazareth, and, and, and they, are, they differ. And that is what we should expect because you will never, the first thing I do at a crime scene is I, I, before I get there, I ask the dispatcher to have the officers on the scene separate the eyewitnesses because I know that if you don't separate the eyewitnesses, they will give you the same story over and over and over again. No, I want slightly different versions of the same story because everyone's perspective is different. What you're interested in causes you to focus on one aspect of the event where somebody else will focus on another. The Beatitudes, uh, the blessed are those, right? If you look at it in Matthew 5, you'll find that Matthew does not mention the woes. He only mentions the blesseds. Luke, though, mentions the blesseds and the woes. I think that both the blesseds and the woes were in that sermon. But for whatever reason, Luke is interested in one aspect. And this is what you would expect. If I interview two witnesses to any sermon from last Sunday, 
I'm going to get two different aspects of the same sermon. Some, maybe some commonality, but some stuff that's not common. I'm not going to suggest that both people are lying or that the sermon didn't take place. I just know that each person is going to bring back some piece that I can pull back together. And so the differences between the gospel accounts were actually what gave me a reason to begin the investigation, because at least that's what I would expect if they were eyewitness accounts. Yeah, that's awesome. That's really helpful um, that it's not a problem that's argue, actually an argument in favor of this being a reasonable explanation, the resurrection. Um, right, that's true. Did, uh, did you have any final questions or comments, Kendra? Well, we're out of time now. <laughs> but um, no, I just wanted to say I'm so grateful for the work that you've done because um, I've had this argument come up a lot with uh, different people that I've talked to and in and, and books and articles and things that I've seen and it never seemed like a good argument to me but I didn't have all of the pieces mm. to put together and I just love how you laid that out with them um, especially with the little red zone and everything it just makes it so much more clear so I, I just appreciate all that you've all the all the hard work that you've done for me <laughs> well I can tell you that all we're doing all of us all three of us are translating for somebody we're simply trying to take this information, which sometimes is pretty hard. That I means a lot of stuff out there. You could read a lot of stuff you could actually investigate. But in the end, what we want to do is translate it in a way that we can throw the ball so that our friends and our family members can catch it. And that's what we're doing here. We're all translators. So I hope that helps you guys too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this has been such a, a great uh, time together, Jim. I really appreciate it. And I uh, hope we can uh, do this again in the future sometime. <laughs> Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Kayla. I appreciate you so much. Hey, thanks again, Kendra. Good to see you. I have a great family. I get, hope we get a chance to get up to Texas again soon. We get to hang out some more. Yeah, that'd be great. You have a good one.